once, while Christianity was young, and the disciples of the Master still walked the earth, there was a beautiful soul who dedicated his life to the search for the face of Christ. For one night, while lying in the stone cell where he had been cast by the pagan emperors, his spirit broken and his mind reeling with uncertainty, a wondrous vision appeared to this yearning one who had for so many years been sickened by the world's woe. On the wall of his stone cell, a great light appeared, and in its center gleamed the face of Christ, surrounded by a golden halo of glory. On the Master's brow was the wreath of thorns, and his great eyes, though filled with mortal agony, shone with divine compassion. From that day on, the soul of the Christian was filled with but one desire. There was but one thing in all the world to live for, but one quest which would form a worthy adventure, and this was to find again the glorious face that had shone from the wall of his cell. In some mysterious way, he was released from the prison, and taking his staff in hand, he vowed he would wander the world until he found again the face of his master. Though the quest be long, though suffering and privation stand in the way, he resolved that nothing should deter him from this one thing to which his soul aspired. His travels took him into distant countries, through snowy wastes and over desert sands. Amid all the people of the world, he sought the face of the one he loved. One day, while wandering in a distant land, he heard of a wise one, who, it was said, lived in a tiny hut made of the leaves of trees by the side of a great cliff at whose base a mountain stream ran to the sea. After searching for many days in a strange and broken country, where it seemed that the gods of creation had hurled great rocks at the demons of darkness, the wanderer found the hut. In answer to his gentle tap upon the door, an aged figure appeared and asked in kindly tones with deep sympathy in his voice what the wanderer sought. The Christian, hungering for the kindness and sympathy so long denied, poured out from his heart to the kindly ears of the aged one his tale of anguish and disappointment. My child, answered the aged one to the question the seeker had so often asked, you seek to find the face of your master. You seek to know where they have laid the Christ. But when they went to his tomb, they found it empty. You are right, my son. He has not gone far away. He is near. And if you know where to seek truth, you shall find him and know his ways. Here is a little vial. In it is a mystic fluid which was prepared by the Essenes, the holy men of Mount Taba. It is called the drink of the gods. If you but taste it, to you it shall be given to find the thing that you seek. He handed the little glass to the lonely pilgrim, who with a blessing of thanks accepted it. But the philosopher raised his hand in warning. Wait. One other thing you must know. One thing you must promise before it shall be given to you to drink this mystic draught. Whatever you see reflecting this face, the face of Christ, that you must serve to that, you must make some sacrifice or give something that is precious to you. That will I gladly, cried the hungry soul, as he bowed to receive the aged philosopher's blessing. 
Silently he passed out of the hut, bending low at the little doorway, clasping the precious object close to his heart. He wandered off again into the wilderness. Reaching a quiet spot in a glorious valley, the Christian stopped, and sitting down upon a prostrate tree, took the little vial in his hands and gazed at the wondrous liquid of ever-changing light and color that sparkled in the tiny crystal shrine. Unsealing and opening it, the truth-seeker with a silent prayer drained the contents. A strange feeling stole over him, and before his eyes there rose a golden haze of light, which benumbed for an instant every atom of his being. But in a moment the mist cleared, and the mystic gazed around in amazement, not unmixed with terror. As far as he could see in every direction, the world was a gleaming mass of light that seemed to stream out from the center of every living thing, and toward him from all directions there gazed millions of faces, all alike, each one of them the head of his crucified Savior. It seemed that each stick and stone shone forth with the glory of that face, each bird and tree poured out its soul through those two sorrowful eyes and the glorious radiance of the light. The Christian fell upon his knees in prayer, for even the grains of sand on which he walked shone forth with the glorious countenance of his Lord, and each time he placed his feet upon the ground he shuddered, for they fell upon the Master's face. At last a voice told him to rise and go on. As he proceeded, his heart faint within him, he came near to the foot of a monstrous mountain of black granite. Gazing across the lakelet, he saw a wondrous face, more glorious than all the others, shine out from the very side of the mountain. It was the face of Christ. And as he watched, Thin streamlets of blood poured down the agonized countenance from beneath the wreath of thorns. The mystic stretched out his arms with a single cry, Messiah. He looked down into the waters which lapped the rocks at his feet, and there gleaming from his own soul, from his own being reflected in the water, was the face of the Master. Each way he turned, the faces gazed at him. Even the air seemed filled with millions of them. Even in the clouds themselves, this glorious visage, with its divine sadness, gazed steadily at him, imprinting its agony and sorrow in every fiber of his soul. At last he could endure it no longer. Those eyes burned into his very being, they seemed to reproach him, and yet were filled with sweetness and with love. With a great cry, he raised his arms before his face and plunged headlong into the waters at his feet. He seemed to be twisting and floating in the midst of an endless darkness. Slowly, he ceased to move, and at last the gray lights of earth began to flicker around him. He awakened and found himself sitting on the little plateau where he had come to drink of the crystal liquid in the tiny vial. The realization of what he had sought filled his soul with a truer understanding of the mystical Christ. And while the faces no longer gazed out at him, wherever he went, he could feel their presence. And at last he realized where his master had been laid. Quickly climbing among the rocks, he sought again the hut of the philosopher to tell him of the wondrous vision he had seen. But the little rustic dwelling of leaves and sticks was gone. No trace of it could he find among the mountains. 
the little vial had vanished also. All remembrance slowly faded away. All that remained was the face he had sought. The years rolled on from town to town, from little village to mystic hermitage. The Christian prophet made his way, and to everyone he told the mystery of the Christ as he had seen it. He told of the Last Supper, of how every day it is repeated that men may live. He told of the Christ and the blades of grass, how bird and beast reflect the light of the Master. He told of the spark that shines forth from the souls of men and the glorious faces in the grains of sand. And bowing humbly to each flower and shrub, he told how Christ dies daily that man's glory may increase. So through the years he was beloved of men. He went forth healing the sick, assisting all who suffered, giving words of cheer to those who were heavy laden, not for their sakes alone and never for his own, but only that the divine hope that his words of life would bring a smile to that sorrowing face that shone out from every creature that he served. He loved the birds and flowers, and even the wild animals served and honored him, for he loved them all. From beneath the little feathered breasts of the fowls of the air, the Christian saw the Master's face shining out with its wreath of thorns, and even the wolves that howled through the darkness of the night proclaimed the agony of Christ. The years rolled on, and still he served in the name of the Master's face. No longer had he friend or foe. No longer was one man different from another. The only thing he saw in others was that glorious light crucified by the sin and ignorance of the world. The passing years bent his back, the steps once strong and steady grew weak and halting, but still the Christian fulfilled his pledge to serve all things in which he had seen the Master's face. He loved the little children and was beloved by them, for in their laughing eyes he saw the sorrowing ones of the Master, and beneath the so-called joys of the world he saw a hungry heart Amidst the bustling throngs of human beings, he beheld the lowly Nazarene begging kindness from the hands of men. Every ringlet waving around some glorious face whispered to this Christian's heart the mystery of the wreath of thorns. The world could not understand the soul of this lonely mystic, Yet in spite of his strange ways and stranger words, he was loved of all, who if they did not comprehend the vision of the seer, still felt in some mysterious way the power and glory of his work. He lived in a tiny cabin fashioned by his own hands out of rough lumber and rougher stones. He blessed even the stones as he tenderly placed them. For from each, the eyes of his loved one seemed to shine. One night a voice spoke to him as he lay on his straw-covered cot, saying, The Master calls you. Go ye to the tops of the distant mountains. The kindly old man rose from his pallet, and taking the staff he used to support his steps through the snow, he started alone in perfect faith into the storm, as he had many times before on his errands of mercy. A knowing one said that this was his last trip, that the blinding tempest, the darkness, and the treacherous ravines would claim him as their own. But the seer knew otherwise, for though the storm burst among the mountains and rocks overburdened by the snow were hurled headlong from the heights, the stones refused to fall on one who loved them all so well, 
and the darkness of the night was lighted by little gleaming sparks that he might know his way. The wild creatures of the wood came forth and guided him. And as he wandered through the darkness, the blizzards and the snow, he raised his eyes to heaven, saying, Father, why dost thou so protect me? And the answer came, I do not. The love that thou hast given forth serves thee in thine extremity. Once again the aged Christian stood as he had that wondrous night when he drank the liquid from the mystic vial the philosophers had given him. The rocks and snow gleamed again with the glory of their Lord, their radiance softened by the divine face he had served so long among men. But now the wreath of thorns was gone. It was no longer the face of agony, but one of sweet peace and divine encouragement. O oh, Master, cried the old man in ecstasy, have I helped to bring to thy face this smile? And as far as the light could go, the millions of faces nodded in reply. The old Christian sank upon his knees, crying, O oh, Father, I thank thee, for my life indeed has not been in vain. My labors have had their reward. No greater than this could any man desire, for I have seen my Messiah smile. Then the great blizzards, so long hanging over the mountains, burst upon the lonely traveler, beating upon him with swirling sheets of snow and wrapping hail, which striking the rocks broke and scattered like pebbles about him. For a little way, the solitary figure struggled against the elements, but at last sank by the wayside. As he gazed out in the falling snowflakes, he clasped his hands in prayer, for each glistening particle had turned into a shining face, and he was being buried, as it were, in a mantle made of the loving eyes of the master he had served. Suddenly a great hush fell over the mountains, and out of the heart of the storm appeared a celestial, white-robed figure whose hands stretched forth to bring peace to the world. Slowly the faces vanished from the wood and stone, and the light gathered around the single stranger who was coming through the night. But with a cry of divine joy, the aged Christian staggered to his feet, and half falling, half running, with hands outstretched, he rushed toward the approaching figure. At last the glory of his work was crowned, for the wondrous form walking toward him was that of the Christ he so long had served. Heeding not the rough stones, he fell on his knees amidst the driving snow before the Christ, and clasping the hem of his raiment, kissed it. Without a word, the glorious figure stooped, and lifting in his arms the form broken with age, as though it had been but a child, he carried it slowly away over the mountains and the valleys into the very skies themselves. The wanderer had come home. He lay down in his father's house to sleep, conscious of the great compassion which he knew reached out to all creation. As he closed his eyes, he saw that the master he had loved so well was still regarding him with divine tenderness. The next day, when the storm had abated, the people of the village went out to search for the mystic they had loved. For they had followed his footsteps and knew that he lay somewhere in the wilderness of snow. They found his staff, and the little package of herbs that he carried. But of him there was no sign. Sadly, they shook their heads and pointed to the great ravines and steep precipices and rushing waters beneath. For they did not know that the old man was at last one with the face he had sought.
This is the end of the recording on side one. Turn the cassette over to play side two. Once there was an alchemist who sought among the mysteries of nature and of science to find the elixir of life and the philosopher's stone. In order that his labors might not be disturbed, this mystic chemist withdrew from the world of men to a cave far in the side of a hill, and there he built a laboratory and brought ancient and rare books for his library. He equipped it with all the apparatus of the chemist, with burners and flasks, and many strange and weird instruments. Here, for many years, he labored with chemicals, herbs, and simples, seeking to find the secret of perpetual youth, and in his own narrow yet earnest way, to discover the lost blessing of mankind, the panacea, the balm of Gilead, promised by the sacred writings of old. For over forty years he plied his task in the laboratory, pulverizing herbs and metals, seeking from the depths of the earth to the furthermost corners of the sky for the answer to his great problem. Many amazing and masterly discoveries were filed away in his diary. Many learned secrets he gleaned from his experiments. Many surprising truths from his studies. But the master secret of alchemy, the crowning achievement, continued to elude him. With all his studies and his labors, he was forced to admit that he had not found the answer to the mystery of mysteries. One day, as he sat in his laboratory, dejected and disconsolate, there flashed across his mind an entirely new thought. Could it be that he was not searching where the light was? Could it be that these ancient writers, these honored scientists, had themselves failed, and that only a blind alley was disclosed to those who studied their works? It was a thought that almost overwhelmed his heart. He sat dazed in his chair. His head fell upon his arms, which rested on the table, and a heart long pent up gave way to sorrow. At any rate, I have failed, he mused. Either those who wrote knew not the secret, or else I have not read aright the meaning of their words. The things I seek I cannot find. The truths that I would know elude me like the will of the wisp. The power of those masters in whose footsteps I would tread and whose truths I would penetrate have not been revealed to me, either by the words of my brothers or by my own searching. Then another thought dawned upon his soul. He laid aside his books, closed the numberless closets with their vials and retorts, and sitting down again in his great chair, bowed his head in prayer, and asked like a child the way that he should tread. He called upon the names of the great ones who had gone before. He asked that the mystic alchemists of old should guide his footsteps, that he might learn the truths that would serve his fellow men. Suddenly, as he sat there, a voice spoke to him. Brother, what do you seek? The old alchemist started in amazement and turned in his chair, for he knew of none who could have guessed the secret of that hidden cave, or who could have entered so silently that his reveries had not been disturbed. A tall, slender man with dark eyes and broad, noble forehead, stood behind him, draped from head to foot in a mysterious cape of indigo. The stranger parted the cloak, and his long, slim hands drew back its folds. Who are you, demanded the alchemist in surprise, who thus comes to break my solitude? 
I am that I am, answered the stranger. Know you not that words mean nothing, that names are but terms for forms, but what I am and what I mean to you is all important. You may call me the brother of the blue cape. You do not know me, but I know you. For many years you have labored in this cave, seeking the true answer to the riddle of life and the solution of the mystery of being. Many times I have assisted you, but you could not know this, for until you called me, I could not come. You have sought in all the world of natural things, with book and chemical, with telescope, crucible, and retort. Though you have studied long, you have not learned the mysteries of the alchemist. You have sought to glean from the sages of old their sacred truths, but you have failed in all your attempts, for while you have learned many things, you know little more of the deeper secrets than when you started. There are those in this world, however, in whose souls the alchemist lives eternal, and who carry within the locket of their own hearts the secret of the lost panacea, in whose innermost being still flows the elixir of life, and who know the secret of the furnace in which the philosopher's stone is made. Lay aside your books and your alembics for a moment, and learn of the path that leads to the light. The old alchemist leaned back in his chair, his eyes fixed on the face of the intruder. The brother of the blue cape crossed, and sitting down beside him, spoke in soft, musical tones, which comforted the heart of the lonely seeker, and illumined him with the light he had looked for so long. Know you, brother, said the mystic, that all the secrets of alchemy are concealed within the folds of this cape of blue. It is not merely a stone that you seek, nor a liquid to fill your vials, but the true quest of the alchemist is for the indigo cape. In the universe about us, behold how the Father enfolds within the blue cape of heaven all his children. Behold how the masters gather under the folds of their garments and under the protection of their cloaks the hearts of men. Know you that alchemy is that process in man which shapes this cape, and only those who wear this mystic raiment may claim to know the formulae of alchemy. All the powers of the universe wear these wondrous cloaks of many colors, for indigo is made of all the tones. In life, these hues are called compassion, purity, and service. It is beneath the cape, which is called compassion, that the servants of the Father gather his wayward children. They labor in the Father's name, for the blue of the sky is but a vast cloak, which he winds lovingly about creation. It is this cloak which each must weave as a living vesture that brings with it completion the realization of truth. All the masters wear capes. Their very lives are cloaks. For their hearts are so great that they seek to enfold all living things within the glory of their love. These capes are the garments of protection. They are indeed the cloaks of wisdom more precious than any earthly garment. But these capes are broad. They have many folds. Those who seek the truth must learn that the stone of the philosopher is always concealed somewhere within the blue cloak of initiation. Each truth that is woven into the living garment of the soul brings with it a great advancement, a more complete revelation of spiritual consciousness. There are thousands laboring with mankind who are not of mankind, who, like the spirits of Venus and of Jupiter, are bound to the earth by the needs of its children. 
There are many active here who long for freedom to do greater things. Noble souls from worlds unknown are chained to earth by the ignorance of man. The eldest of the brothers are forced continually to perform the labors that man should do. The masters must come from their cosmic tasks to adjust the difficulties of the ignorant. They must gather the wayward souls under the protective folds of their vast mantles. These cloaks are woven of the life of truth, of knowledge, and of power. Each time a soul is found in the world of men, who will take upon itself the sorrows of the world, who labors that others may have more light, who learns the things worthwhile and becomes strong enough to carry the burdens of humanity. When such an one is found, the master takes off his own mantle and places it upon the shoulders of his disciple. The master is then free to advance to greater works, to don a more ample and more burdensome garment. In the days that are to come, the children of earth must bear the responsibilities beneath which now the gods are bowed. The powers of light are searching for those who will wear their garments, whose souls are great enough to be the capes of blue, wide-spreading enough to gather earth's weakest ones beneath their folds. The old alchemist's eyes were closed, and he heard the words as in a dream. But suddenly a great flood of light descended into his being. He saw the things so long hidden, the truth so long concealed streamed into his aspiring soul. I have found it, he cried. I have found the philosopher's stone. I see its light radiating from the depth of my own soul. I have found the elixir of life as it pours upon me from the rivers of living water. I feel the balm of Gilead as drop by drop it falls from my wounded heart. I see. I see. You have seen well, answered the mystic, as he sat and folded in his mantle. For know that out of your own being flows the lost panacea for the world's woe. The kindly action, the soft touch, the smile in the moments of sorrow, these make up the elixir of life to your fellow men. The philosopher's stone shines in resplendent glory from the one who has lived the life and learned to know the doctrine. While the balm of Gilead is in truth the loving word in the moment of sorrow, the selfless compassion in the hour of need. Your quest is over, brother. You have found those things for which you sought. Your years of labor have their reward. Your diligence has not been in vain. Now what will you do with it? How will you use the precious secrets which have been disclosed to you? The old alchemist rose to his feet, his eyes alight with a strange glow which revealed the glory of the light within. His tottering footsteps grew stronger, as though indeed he had found the fountain of eternal youth. His shaking hands grew steadier, while he straightened himself and pointed toward the villages outside the cave. I'm going back again, he cried. All these years I have hidden myself away in this cave under the hill, but now I see that my place is in the world. I'm going back to tell all the truth that you have unveiled to me. I will go out to live the philosopher's stone. Of the elixir of life and the balm of Gilead I will give to all mankind, rich and poor, young and old, and of whatever caste, whatever creed. They shall see the light that I have found. They shall also know how I found it, that gods have been gracious and have given me the treasure I sought. And now I dedicate these treasures to the service of men. The stranger of the blue cape smiled and taking the old man by the shoulder, led him back to the chair, saying, Sit down and rest. You have found the object of your quest and your soul is filled with great compassion. You shall indeed serve your brother men to the glory of your God 
and the liberation of the masters. Slowly the old man's head sank upon his breast. His heart beating fast with the glory of his great discovery was quieted by the hand of the master. The mystic stood over him while the old alchemist slept as peacefully as a child. Rest, brother, whispered the mystic, for your quest has been long and the search intense. Rest, for before you are labors eternal. You are now coming to the day when for you rest shall be no more. Sleep, for the eyes now closed will be open for ages. Be happy now, for before you on distant Calvary rises the shadow of a cross. The mystic sank on his knees and clasping his hands raised his eyes to heaven praying, Father, I thank thee that another has found the light, that a soul long wandering has taken the path which leads to liberation. I thank thee that I have been freed for a greater task. I thank thee, Father, that this soul has found this day the thing it sought. And, O oh God eternal, help me in my endless search for the keys to the mysteries. In the name of thy blessed Son. The Master rose, and taking off his mantle of indigo, laid it over the shoulders of the sleeping alchemist. Here, brother, is the garment that I have worn. But a short time ago, I gathered you in its folds. Now I give it to you with all its joys, with all its sorrows. Under its folds gather you the souls of men. In the name of the Great One, whose blue cape envelops creation. The mystic then walks slowly from the cave, his face calm with peace and divine compassion. He raised his eyes once more to the light streaming from the heavens. Father, I am ready for thy greater works. From somewhere, two hands reached down, and a great cloak of blue fell upon the mystic's shoulders, far more voluminous, far more cumbersome than the other. He staggered under the weight of its massive folds, as the Christ staggered beneath the weight of his cross. But with a strength divine he rose, and spreading wide the folds which seemed to carry within them the whole creation, he cried out with a joyous voice to the world in pain, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. With this great cape, protecting and concealing thousands of living creatures, the mystic floated silently over the world, gathering under the folds of his garments the souls of men. The alchemist had taken the lesser task and freed the master for a greater. When the old alchemist awoke, he could discern no garment of blue, but his soul, wakened by its vision, had become invested in the indigo cape of compassion, which forever unfolds the sorrows of the world. This is the end of this cassette.